hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Now this is qu quoted directly several times in Hebrews, but not only is it quoted in Hebrews directly, but it's alluded to, or the imagery of it is presented to us again and again, that the Lord Jesus is set down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And then uh, also we get in verse 4, the Melchizedek priesthood of Christ brought out. Uh, verse 4 says, The Lord has sworn and will not repent, thou art a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. And so again, in the epistle of Hebrews, a major portion of it, uh, chapter 5, with a parenthesis in chapter 6, and chapter 7, is about the Melchizedek priesthood of Christ and how that there was a change in the priesthood, uh, in the order of the priesthood from the Levitical uh, to uh, the Melchizedek priesthood. And the writer of the Hebrews uses uh, this verse in Psalm 110 to show that God had promised that there would be another type of priesthood, um, a kingly priesthood, uh, a priest who is also a king. Uh, which is entirely different from the whole Levitical order of things. Because otherwise, how would the Jewish people uh, know? How would they uh, understand that God was going to change from what he had given to Moses and through the sons of Aaron? It was a big shift for them. So it, it, the shift is based on a Psalm 110. And then, of course, the following uh, chapters of Hebrews uh, are de developed uh, upon uh, this whole idea. That is uh, chapters 8, 9, and 10. And so uh, the very structure of the epistle is based on Psalm 110. Now, uh, the Lord Jesus uh, quoted uh, Psalm 110 in uh, Matthew's Gospel, uh, chapter 22, where the Lord had been uh, questioned for several days by the Jewish leaders. He would come up to the temple and preach, teach the people. And then the leaders, the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees and the Herodians, one after the other, and sometimes all together, would come before him and give him sort of naughty questions, tempting him to see if they could trip him up uh, somehow. And then finally, the Lord Jesus asks them a question. And he says uh, uh, in verse 42 of uh, Matthew 22, uh, well, we'll back up to verse 41. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? And they said unto him, The son of David. Well, they were correct in saying the son of David. But then the Lord asked them another question. Verse 43, He said unto them, How then does David in spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make your enemy, uh, thine enemies thy footstool. Uh, if David then called him uh, Lord, how is he his son? So in quoting Psalm 110, uh, verse 1, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Um, he, he's saying that, or asking him, how can, be, how can Messiah be David's son? Which everyone knew that the prophets spoke of that. Even the Psalms spoke of that. And how could he be at the same time his Lord? They couldn't answer that question. But of course, the Lord Jesus himself was the answer to that question because he was both perfectly God, uh, perfectly man uh, and, and he was a descendant of David. He was a direct descendant of David uh, through uh, uh, Mary and legally through Joseph. But he was also the son of God. Uh, and so he was God and man in, in one person. He was the answer to that question. If they had received him, they would have got the answer. But verse 46 of Matthew 22 says, And no man was able to answer him a word, uh, and neither did uh, any man dare to ask him any more questions from that day forth. So the Lord sort of stymied the, the Pharisees um, with uh, this um, verse from Psalm 110. Another point I should make before we go back to Psalm 110, uh, here in Matthew 22, the Lord uh, shows that it's inspired by the Spirit. Because he says in verse 43, uh, How then does David in spirit, that is by the power of the Holy Spirit, call him Lord, saying... So what the Lord Jesus was saying about Psalm 110, that David wrote in the power of the Holy Spirit. In other words, that he was inspired. So now let's look a little more detail at, uh, at Psalm 110 itself. We've already read verse 1, and I've shown how the, the epistle to the Hebrews is, is largely based on this, that... Uh, Messiah would sit down on God's throne at the right hand of God. Um, and, you know, the, the, the Jewish believers were still attached to the temple. And what the writer of the Hebrews wanted to show is 
that he has passed into the heavens and he has established a new priesthood. We'll get to that in a few minutes. But, um, but he has set down on the right hand of God until uh, your enemies are made your footstool. And so what we get in verse 1 is the present dispensation, the present session of Christ at the right hand of God. The Lord Jesus was crucified. He rose again from the dead and he ascended to the right hand of God. There he is. He's, he's at the right hand of God sitting, waiting, and he's waiting till his enemies be made his footstool. This also is quoted in Hebrews. That as far as uh, with respect to his friends, he has sat down. He accomplished salvation for them. He accomplished eternal redemption for them. He died for their sins and rose again. He had, and now he has sat down. That work is done. He never needs to rise again with respect to the question of sin. Hebrews brings that out. But uh, he's seated there waiting until a time comes when his enemies will be made his footstool. That's at his second coming. And so that's what the rest of the psalm uh, looks at. Verse 2 to the end to verse 7 deals with his second coming and with his millennial rule. But verse 1, uh, we're still in verse 1. Uh, the Lord Jesus has not come back. He's still seated at the right hand of God. And so it's amazing how we look at this prophecy uh, Psalm 110 verse 1, it's still ongoing. The Lord Jesus is still seated there. Uh, verse 2, the Lord shall send uh, the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. It speaks of his future rule over the earth. Uh, uh, verse 2 is very similar to what we have in Psalm 2 where it speaks of his rod of iron that he will receive the, inherit the nations for his inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for his possession and he'll rule then with a rod of iron, he'll dash the nations as a potter dashes clay vessels. And uh, so verse 2 is, is sort of connected with that. It's sort of a twin verse to that. But it speaks of his second coming. So here we have it, and I want you to notice this. Between verse 1 and verse 2, the whole church age has passed over. In other words, the Lord Jesus has sat down. And as I said, it's he's still there. But there's nothing else in between that and him ruling over the earth at his second coming. Because the church itself, what he's doing on uh, today in the world, gathering uh, believers, gathering sons and daughters from the Jews and from uh, mostly amongst the Gentiles from every nation, gathering them, baptizing by the Spirit into one body, that there's one church and one body. Uh, the church is a mystery. The prophets don't speak of the church. The Psalms don't speak of the church. And and we don't have the time to go into this, but Paul brings this out in Ephesians chapter 3, that this was a mystery hid in God. Uh, the prophets never spoke of it. But now in the New Testament, it has been revealed by the New Testament prophets and, and by the apostles, by the Holy Spirit. has brought out this mystery of Christ and the church, that Christ is linked to his church, and the church is linked to their head in heaven. The body of Christ is linked to its head in heaven. And when that body is complete on earth, then the Lord Jesus will come and the, the rapture will happen. The body of Christ will come up in the first resurrection to be with Christ in heaven. And we'll wait with him until the end of the great tribulation. And then we'll be revealed with him in glory as he begins his reign over the earth. And um, Colossians 3 speaks of this. That when Christ who is our life is manifested, we'll be manifested with him in glory. But of course Psalm 110 doesn't speak of this at all. It speaks of him sitting down at the right hand of God, waiting for that time when his enemies to be made his footstool. And then verse 2, when that time has arrived, when he will rule over his enemies. You see the end of verse 2, it says, rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. But in between those two verses, the whole church age is passed over. Now verse 3, it says, thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. <clears throat> in the beauty of holiness from the womb of the morning, thou hast the dew of thy youth. Now, there's a lot in this verse, but I would just say for our uh, for our purpose in, in these talks, uh, <clears throat> verse three, ver the first part of verse three, thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. That's not the church. That's the people of Israel. You see, they, today they are not willing. They're in blindness. Paul speaks of that in Romans chapter 11. Blindness and season has <clears throat> happened under the people of Israel, but it's just for a season. And in 2 Corinthians, Paul says, when they read verses like this, a veil is upon their eyes and it won't be lifted until they turn again in repentance to Christ. <clears throat> so thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. Now is not the day of thy power. 
It's not the day of the Lord's power. If, the, if it was the day of his power now, why is all this evil going on in the world? He would put down the evil. He would rid the world of the evil and of the, of the wickedness that we see all around about us. No, it's the day of his grace where he's long-suffering, patient, not willing that any should perish. It's the day of his grace. Um, it's also the, the hour of darkness as well. When, when they came to arrest the Lord Jesus in Luke's gospel, chapter 22, verse 53, he says uh, to the soldiers, now is your hour and the power of darkness. This is the hour of, of Satan when he is the God of this world still. But it's also the day of God's grace when he's calling people out unto Christ. But the day of his power will come at the coming of Christ. And um, so we can just quickly move on to verse 4. Uh, the Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek means uh, king of righteousness and king of peace. And as I said, Hebrews brings this uh, out and um, mentions that there's, it's a new priesthood uh, that uh, has uh, been established, a new order of priesthood, the Melchizedek priesthood. And the Lord was born from the tribe of Judah. He wasn't, uh, he wasn't from Aaron. He wasn't from the tribe of Levi. So he could never be a priest after the Levit Levitical order here on earth at all. Uh, but uh, this verse shows that uh, God has sworn and God has promised these two immutable things that he would establish this priesthood, uh, this new priesthood in which he's both a king and a priest, a, a priestly king. Now, you, you know, if, if you've studied the Bible at all, that um, the, the priesthood and the, and the royal side of things, that is the king and the priest and the Old Testament order of things was strictly separated. Remember, there was a king, I think it was Uzziah, who tried to bring the two of them together. He tried to act as a priest and he became a leper. So these things were strictly separated, but under the Lord Jesus, he will be both priest and king. And um, there are many prophecies that look at that. I could refer you to, for example, uh, Zechariah chapter 6, if you want to look that up on your own time. He'll be a priest and a king upon his throne. That's in a future day. Uh, and uh, there will be righteousness and peace on the earth. Righteousness first and then peace. That's always the order. We've already seen that. So there's many, many things we could say about Melchizedek. He priest of the Most High God. Uh, uh, possessor of heaven and earth all things in heaven and earth will be gathered together unto him uh, Genesis 14 uh, brings out uh, Melchizedek as well but uh, time doesn't permit to go into the detail of it but then we get more about his second coming in verse 5 the Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath you see uh, we said that we spoke of the day of his power that today is the day of his grace but now he characterizes the day of his power in another way he characterizes it in verse 5 as the day of his wrath, when he will judge the nations and the kings. And so we see this in uh, Revelation 19, that, that he's the king of kings, and he will uh, smite the kings of the earth at the battle of Armageddon. And then verse 6, and he will judge amongst the nations and fill with do many places uh, with dead bodies. He shall wound the head, or this is the head's plural, but could be the head. Some see that as the, the beast or Antichrist. Some see it as the Assyrian, the king of the north. Um, we're not 100% sure. I wouldn't be dogmatic, dogmatic on points like that. But nevertheless, nevertheless he'll put away uh, the, the wickedness, the iniquity uh, of the earth. He will judge the kings of the earth. And then verse 7, he will drink uh, the brook by the way. That his, <clears throat> he'll be um, bringing in peace uh, to this earth. And, you know, when he was on the earth, he always drank of the brook in the way. He was always the dependent man. But, you know, he, the Lord Jesus will be a man forever, and he will be a priest.